There are events in history, rare, but so catastrophic, they are like fault lines breaking the progression. Each disaster has its own starting point. The Chernobyl disaster began 34 years ago with the turning of a switch. On April 26, 1986, in the city of Pripyat, Ukraine, just hours before the disaster that would have effects for many millennia to come, workers were at their posts, as they were every day, to ensure the Chernobyl nuclear reactor was working as it should. The work would stop for a short while that day. It was for a scheduled test. In case of an electrical power outage, the reactors needed to be cooled safely. But a few details were overlooked. Reactor unit number four's output readings were abnormal. Something was not right with this unit. The first link in the chain of fatal mistakes began with this detail being missed. Any test in this situation could turn into a calamity. So began the drill. The plant's electricity was shut down. The nuclear cores were cooling. But unit number four wasn't cooling down. It was overheating. In that moment, the panicked engineers make a huge mistake. The second they hit the emergency button, it was all over. While one of the worst catastrophes in history was playing out, the short and bitter announcement was seared in our minds. After the explosion, the world's focus collectively turned to the Soviets. Workers were sent immediately to begin clearing rubble from the facility. Their only goal was to finish as quickly as possible and get out. But it was much worse than they had anticipated. The workers were never able to leave Chernobyl. The removal efforts that started back then continue to this day. Over the past few years, almost 500,000 laborers have worked here, and many paid a heavy price. A serial killer, unleashed by the explosion, still lingers here. Cesium-137. It will take thousands of years for this radioactive isotope's destructive effects on nature to diminish. The impact on humans has not yet been fully determined. Chernobyl is thought to be the cause for the increase in cancer cases in Europe and the Balkans. What we find in a hospital that was witness to the first moments of the cataclysm and then evacuated answers many questions.
трудовой деятельности. Но не всегда острая лучевая болезнь так легко протекает. Я тебя хочу расспросить, как все дело было, как ты получил правду? Глухой зрит, слышал. Да. Да. Ну я не обратил внимания. Потом второй. Я подумал сначала, что где-то рядом рвутся кислородные баллоны. There's still more than 2,000 people working here. These were the cooling towers. So, see, there were two unfinished cooling towers. <coughs> In '86, they were building reactors five and six and a separate cooling system for them. But after the accident, they had to stop all construction works. The records note 30 lives lost in the explosion, but there is no written record of the lives lost while battling cancer or the pain they experienced. In the ghost city of Pripyat, every ruin seems to scream of what was. They carry the signs of a forced displacement, only two hours to gather themselves. traces of time frozen by the explosion, we come to a school. One day, students were playing in the yard. Classes about the power of the Soviet Union were being taught. And the next day, it was all abandoned. Hundreds of children whisked away from the poisonous cloud of radiation Many schools like this left to decay. The remains of the lives disrupted overnight are everywhere. Looking at the remnants, we could see how abrupt their evacuation had been. We wandered through the classrooms, looking at the things scattered about. We thought about the plans the teachers and their students had for the next day. If there had not been an explosion, would they have gone on a picnic or prepared for an exam? Everything was left unfinished. Words, games, dreams. The gloom in this building would never dissipate. These desks would never be used again. The notebooks would disappear. The impact of the accident would last for 48,000 years. In light of these thoughts, the remains took on a new meaning for us. Who knew we could be the last generation to travel here? The future is dark. pondered on the children that lived through that day. The survivors grew into adults with terrible memories. The trauma must have affected their whole future. Maybe some had bravely returned to gather their memories. But time, like an angry blacksmith, had beaten everything in its path. Much of it may still be radioactive, what was once in aid of education 
friendly to children. The tools, books, and pencils was now deadly. We can even feel the heaviness of the air we breathe. Nothing here will improve anytime soon. Immediately after the meltdown, people within a 30 kilometer radius were evacuated. In the beginning stages, 135,000 people. Then, over the next few years, almost 300,000 were removed. Evacuation from a ravaged city was torture in itself. People left waiting for hours were already exposed to radiation. We change course, turning our sights to the city's fairground and delve into another world. The huge machines meant to entertain the masses resemble the set of a horror movie. The empty cars of the Ferris wheel carried the signs of its years carrying children. The bumper cars, instead of merrily crashing, are left rotting away. Nature's strong arms had embraced this place. When people disappear suddenly, it is the inevitable reality. There had been some experiments done on the impacts of radiation. Giant syndrome was one of them. Plants and animals showed mutation, and some could be larger than normal. Some of the vegetation surrounding us could be these mutations. There were many unknowns here, and many more places to discover. Time had completely stopped at the enclosed swimming pool. The water that had cooled young and old alike had dried up, leaving only dust-filled pools behind. Playing sports in the contaminated air was meaningless. It was not the time for laughing or having fun or any of the mundane things taken for granted. It all could be left behind. They were focused on one thing only, getting out of the city to survive. The only thing to do for what was left behind was to remember. Every life lost is memorialized throughout the city. Время на отстрелять свою группу.
Не забудьте, пожалуйста, закрыть окна, выключить электрические и газовые приборы. Перекрыть водопроводные краны. Просим закрывать спокойствие. Организовано и порядок при проведении временной эвакуации. Communities where thousands had lived were almost invisible. The big concrete block structures were being swallowed by the forest. After the explosion, these blocks were targeted by callous looters. It could be said that what treasures they stole were fruits of the poison tree. During the years where government oversight was inconsistent, a great deal was stolen. But now, a speck of dust could not leave this city. Notwithstanding the looting, it was still possible to find objects left behind. What we discovered in the dreary building helped us truly feel the tragedy. Hundreds of masks just lay there. We deeply hoped that they had been of use, imagining the effort made just to breathe. It was enough for us to understand what they had experienced. The masks could not hide the desperation in their gaze. evidence was in. Many lives were ruined. The largest man-made disaster had destroyed all surrounding it. were forced to take potassium iodide pills to protect against radiation sickness. Finding access to clean food and water was the biggest difficulty. It caused a global crisis. The places we have seen were directly impacted by the blast, but neighboring countries were also affected. Like Belarus, where citizens also evacuated their homes. 40% of the forests in the Ukraine were also contaminated. 18,000 square kilometers of farmland were unusable. insufficient at this point. The Soviets spent billions of rubles in compensation for the tragedy, but nothing could ever be the same again. Nature works to heal its wounds. It may take the people left behind time to digest, but there is evidence all around that they will never quit. well enough. We reached a deserted train station that was the first and the last stop on the line. The valuable engines were rusting away on the dead end rails. The 
There are rumors that the Soviets secretly used this station until 1991. Maybe these train cars were the covert spy carriages of the times. sites we can visit from the guide taking us through the exclusion zone. Some sites are difficult to enter, but we were intent on pushing the limits. We reached a Soviet radar base. Known as Duga-3, it could still contain military intelligence. The Soviets had built a huge military base to track American planes. Costing several million rubles, the locals were told the base was a radio station. But in fact, it had the technology to detect enemy missiles the second they were engaged. This enormous base employed 1,500, but was just another casualty buried in history by the Chernobyl disaster. Hundreds of other structures like this one continued to regurgitate the poison. In most of them, the radiation levels can reach almost 40 times more than acceptable levels. Under the concrete curtains, buried deep in the heart of Chernobyl, there still lies tons of uranium. For this reason, humankind may never be able to live here ever again. Of all the abandoned places we've explored, Chernobyl is unique. Its story is completely different from the others because the tragedy has not yet ended. We are on a secluded path, winding up the Balkan Mountains. What has brought us here is a monument from the near past. But how is this monument built so far away? Our journey will last until morning. Beyond awaits an architectural work ahead of its time and enigmatic. Kazanlik, Bulgaria. In the first morning light, the fog that has taken the region hostage impressively presents the monument to us. One of the most important structures of the Cold War era stood before us in all its glory. The Buzluja Monument, also known as Bulgaria's UFO. There was so much we wanted to know about this spaceship-like form. Who built it and why? 10 meters had to be shaven off the peak for it to be built. What was the driver for this mind-boggling effort? We cannot move forward due to the unrelenting fog. We will come back tomorrow. Our answers remain in the hands of the sky. The next day, we return treading the same difficult path. At least the fog has relented. Now, we can begin the story of this mysterious structure, so reminiscent of a temple. In 1981, after eight years of tough and laborious construction, it was opened as the Bulgarian Communist Party's house monument. The 
This monument was the Soviet regime's way of challenging the world. It all began in 1868, with 30 Bulgarian resistors rebelling against the Ottomans on this hill. Many people died that day. It was not the end, but the beginning. Ten years later, inspired by the Buzluja rebellion, Bulgarian resistors once again rose up. The war fought in these mountains against the Ottoman state ended in a victory. With this victory, the Bulgarians gained their independence. Since that day, this peak has had a special place for Bulgarians. So much so, that in 1891, a group gathered here to form the Bulgarian Social Democratic Party. The peak that changed the fate of Bulgaria was to be held in high esteem. Finally, in 1981, this monument appeared. And its opening was as ostentatious as itself. Buzluja was witness to many stories, from the disappearance of an empire from its history to the fading of the Cold War. The glow of the hammer and sickle, along with it, and countless others. Glamorous mosaics disappeared from view. Doors opening onto dreams were shut with political locks. Efforts to restore and transform the structure into museum continue. For now, on occasion, it serves as a haven for enthusiasts of nature sports or street artists. But mostly, it serves in solitude, a lonely monument at the peak of the Balkan Mountains, teeming with new beginnings. We've witnessed ideas changing the boundaries of countries, but then words with impact was overtaken by another powerful force. While not flesh and bone, this force had the power for great destruction nonetheless. Flying was an important revolution for us. A point in civilization where humankind, no longer a land mammal, gained its wings. These wings meant more freedom for us, or more captivity. This airplane graveyard in France may help us face our past, for it was the first show for the World War II airplanes. The sky no longer showered only snow and rain. How did this technological power we possessed turn into such killing machines? What other tasks could this American-made 1947 SP-2H Neptune do other than search and destroy missions? It was made to find and wipe out. The crew was trained to be ruthless against enemy forces. Every wire, every switch was there for this reason, and each one of them executed their mission flawlessly. All of the planes in this yard had been active in some war. After World War II, more advanced ones were developed and were sold to other countries. The destinies of wars were now determined by these metal birds. Piston engines were replaced by jet engines they were the reason the race for dominance of the skies sped up. They were built larger to allow for cargo transport. The French-made Nord Noratlas was one of them. It was in the graveyard before being broken down into parts. Or models like the Fuga CM-170 Magister, which had been built smaller for pilot training. 
Many things have changed. But one constant is the pervading smell of gunpowder in the metal. The once merciless executioners, now stowed away from any eyes, left to rust. No one is afraid of them anymore. What frightens people today is their pasts fading like ghosts. We continue searching for the abandoned gods of war. The signals we've tracked have brought us to Italy. Before tasting the pizza, there's a place we want to visit. Pizza, pizza, pizza. There is much to say about the uniqueness of the Italian Alps, but the reality that everything could change in a moment is what is truly singular about it. It's like going through a magic tunnel. The weather turns in the blink of an eye. A sea of mist greets us. While we look for abandoned places on purpose, this road was so dark and gloomy, we felt quite abandoned ourselves. Finally, we reached the station, but could see very little. The one thing we hoped to see was an entrance. After all this effort, the only thing to show for it was a locked door. The weather would not permit further progress. The next day in the Alps. Hoping things would go as planned this time, we returned. Here, a huge deserted base stood before us. This was the Livorno Monte Giojo, a high band radio communication station. Each giant satellite, a tribute left over from the Cold War era, a parabolic antenna with a diameter of 20 meters. This NATO base was operational as of 1958. For many years, Antenna transmitted top-secret information over thousands of kilometers to other bases. This intelligence was used to protect the Allies from the Soviet Union. If you were at the peak of a remote mountain 1,500 meters above sea level at a top-secret military base, you need to be able to be self-sufficient for months. For this reason, everything needed for sustainability, including electricity. NATO soldiers assigned here were forced to leave their family for months. The long days of confined life in the Alps affected most negatively. Yet the risks were deemed necessary in the face of the nuclear threat. No one could attend to the melancholy of the soldiers. The NATO base fell out of favor when satellite communication was more actively used during the 1970s. But it continued to serve until it was shut down in 1995. Once vacated, its new mission was not to fight against nuclear missiles, but vandalism. It was apparent that attempts to make it a tourist site were not successful. It had been deserted for years, but could it still be transmitting signals in hopes of reaching another station? Could there be similar stations to accept its call? Could we find another base alone, but not yet gone?
260 kilometers from the NATO radar station, we find the place the signal reaches. The northern part of the Alps, the transmitter's shape is the reason this is known as the Pixel Station. Pixel Station was isolated, like other bases, and at an altitude of 2,000 meters. It was purchased by an entrepreneur to become a civilian business, but this did not save it from the fate of becoming an abandoned place. To own this site meant fighting a battle with nature. It's hard to work in the cold and rain. To get the best shots of the station, we need to use the right equipment. But the weather in this region is capricious. The mist and clouds mean the readings on our light meter are ever changing. It is as if the station wants to stay in the dark. But we have no intention of giving up. We have to keep trying. Our lengthy efforts pay off when the images show us many stories hidden in their depths. How long this caravan had been here was unknown. It could be a leftover from an adventurer or from someone on duty at the base. The weather changes yet again. Our trial by light continues, but the images we capture at the end will be more than worth our struggle. The Pixel Station was designed with the most important rule for the Cold War era, secrecy. The walls were fortified to withstand potential Soviet attack. With its halls conducive to quick turnarounds and its layout of the rooms that allowed maximum efficiency and minimal space, it had everything a secret military base needed. But when the war ended, it turned out it had a vulnerability. The base, like the other abandoned places, was just as defenseless against vandalism. The walls crumbled, materials stolen or destroyed. Half a century ago, the base that had once invoked the wrath and force of the Soviets upon it was now facing the rage of the vandals. Neither the inclement weather nor the remoteness of the peak had saved it from this rage. This station, at the peak of the Alps, may seem like nothing more than a meaningless gray metal stain now, but there are some abandoned places that are bitterly striking reminders of our history. We've listened to many stories of World War II and its aftermath. We're on to another one. Before we reach our destination, we stand a ways back and look to see if anyone is around. What we hope to find is a deserted radar station and maybe a few people who can tell us about it. When we climb about a hundred meters up the hill, we come across the street artists who currently own it.
A web of graffiti surrounds us. It is everywhere. There is a hidden message on every surface. When we go to explore this massive site, we realize we're in a surreal world. It looked as if our story is changing. The only thing left of the former station was a faint reflection. This enigmatic place was a radar base station located in West Berlin. It was built on the highest hill in the city by the Americans during the Cold War. Everything seems normal to this point, but it isn't. This hill was created with the rubble left from World War II. It's named Teufelsberg, meaning Devil's Mountain. It hides much in its depths. All things here pass through the dreary filter of life. Machines, pictures, and music. The war is over, the hill now covered in trees, but the memories live on. Those keeping the memories alive, the anti-war activists, the homeless living in war-like conditions, and the artists who have their own wars to fight. The base was vacated when the Berlin Wall fell. After that, it turned into an organic canvas. Ideas met, restrictions yielded, and time slowed. In the hands of whimsical artists, Teufelsberg strayed from official rules and smiling as it did so. The Bay Station is filled with the unconventional works of artists in many styles. When imagination is the only limit, sometimes a bathtub is much more than a bathtub. Here, any mundane object becomes something extraordinary. This is now a different country, run by a surrealist king, where military signals and the harsh reality of Cold War once permeated the air, only silence reigned. Endeavors to commercialize Teufelsburg don't appear to be realized anytime soon. The surrealist King's Land is safe for a while. We've been through the lands of metal birds and eyes in the sky. We left each with a touch of melancholy and many images. A little wind and a bit of music will do us good. Have I really been so crazy too? To think your love was mine. Serenading to sinking moons. Oh, I've been so blind. Brittany, Western France. The village of Landevenic is under siege by ghost ships. They have no captains. Their crews long gone. Their days of braving storms are over. They now consist of slowly rusting metal skeletons. Once, the only sound they would fear hearing was the roar of missiles firing from enemy ships. They were the heroes of the Cold War years. They had played the leading role in the tension between the Soviets and the Allied forces. 
they had cost millions of dollars. But as they aged and became obsolete, they were ignored. For this reason, they were left in an isolated graveyard. The village is closed to civilians. The deserted hills surrounding the village make it a sheltered port. In the 1840s, the French used this as a naval base to house their auxiliary fleet and its crew. Now, it is a burial place far from any eyes. Each ship has its own story, but they all share the same destiny. There are Soviet-made ships as well here in this graveyard. The steel soldiers designed to destroy one another now wait to disappear side by side. Now, they wait for fighter planes to sink them during a drill. Quick and painless. And for them, maybe that would be the best end. This could be a great day to get on the road, or it could all go wrong. It wouldn't matter to us either way. We just wanted to brave the infamous rains of Europe to reach the mysterious destination that got our attention. We've heard many legends along our journey, but the tale of this place was truly stunning. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. The biblical quote echoes all over the village of Lukova, 200 miles east of Prague in the Czech Republic. St. George Church, a relic from medieval times, was abandoned due to a terrible accident in 1968. When the roof of the church collapsed in the middle of a funeral, people were terrified. It was more than enough to convince them that the church had been possessed by ghosts. They began referring to it as a haunted ruin. In 2012, a local wanted to save the church, but the fear was too great and the villagers still believed it was cursed. Jakub Hadrava, an art student, didn't intend to break the curse, but to personify it.
These plaster statues are his works of art. They could not better describe how fear enslaves the soul. As time went on, the church gained tourists' attention. The donations from visitors has allowed for roof repairs. No one is certain if the church is a house of God or a home of ghosts. The mystery lingers, and this is what makes it enticing. We've touched on wars during our travels. So many places destroyed. There wasn't much left to say, but there was somewhere to see. Many cities have written their histories in the blood shed by wars. Neither home nor hospitals nor places of worship are exempt from violence. Rage burns everything in its path to ashes. Each time, our civilization manages to be reborn from those ashes. In northern France, we come to one of those places that succeeded in being reborn. Estray Denicou, a quiet little hamlet today. It was once witness to one of the bloodiest battles of World War I. The Battle of the Somme, where almost one million people died, was fought in this area. Soon after, the town, facing World War II, was completely destroyed. Nothing was left standing, not even the church. We are at the Estray Church, built anew after the war by architect Mark Quentin in 1959. The sci-fi vibe of its design opens a portal to beyond our times. The church was given a concrete skeleton and dressed with stained glass by architect Quentin to symbolize the rise of peace and the power of prayer. Because humankind had been lost in the dark, and to persevere, needed light and strength. The church, in its entirety, represents hands clasped in prayer. This is why the locals see it as Mary's hands protecting their town. This church isn't bound by walls, but an open space under one roof. The wooden pews are bathed in light all day. But no matter how beautiful or unique, it needs a congregation. And in the near past, it has been vacated due to too few worshippers. Estray is under guardianship of the Catholic Church and continues to inspire people to this day. Between land and sky, far from any bombs. Crossing through an old path where trees and weeds encroached, we arrived at the place of our next story. We've seen the powerful reflections of faith in almost every European country. People had sacrificed a great deal for God even their own children. If the heroes of an event are children, the scars left behind are deep. We saw many deep scars and heard many rumors during this story.
They say every day at this hour, you can hear an old hymn echo throughout the Italian plains and return back to the abandoned Catholic school. It can go no further because the voices of the children are trapped under the toppled walls. It may be a myth. It may be a belief. Nevertheless, it is true that our customs are shaped within the confines of belief. In this dilapidated Catholic school, here is one of the places our society was shaped. Built in the 1960s, it began its goal to educate immediately. Almost 200 children could be educated here. Each had their own story. None are children anymore, of course. Maybe they aren't even alive. But if you want to listen, their voices are still hidden in these halls. Their parents had delivered them to this school as children. It was for a good purpose. They would sleep in a large room side by side, eat together, learn together. This was the main goal, in fact, to learn to work together. The school's curriculum ranged from sciences to art, and of course, religious studies outlined by the bishop. The students were to be educated in a number of fields and become pious intellectuals. To accomplish this, strong discipline was necessary. The children were formed with this discipline and protected from the harmful effects of the outside world. It had to be that way. Because if they did not learn to look from the same window, they could be enslaved by their own individual dreams, becoming lost in a pain-ridden life. There are many Catholic schools active today, following the same teachings. But this Catholic school was deserted in the 1980s. Its only visitors became homeless vandals, or former students wishing to see the decaying past. Each of their tales may be different, but one thing they share. Each child's personality, in large part, was shaped here. But a lot of information about this school needs to be confirmed. All the things we haven't found out about the places we visit occupy our minds. But then, there are places we know too much about and wish we hadn't had to learn. Even if you're a ruthless dictator, there are things 
beyond your control, like dreaming. In the furthest corner of northeast Germany lies a heap of concrete, a former hotel that decorated the dreams of the poor in Nazi Germany. In Binz, a small coastal town on Rügen Island, are the foundation of the hotel cast on Hitler's orders, called the Hotel Prora. It consisted of eight identical buildings. It was designed so that most rooms had views of the sea. It was to be affordable, a place for workers to enjoy holidays for a few days a year, and also continue to feel gratitude to Hitler. It seemed a dream too difficult to reach for the workers, but their hope blossomed green until war came knocking. Their leader, to whom they were beholden, had decided to paint the world blood red. With the beginning of the Second World War, this dream hotel and its 10,000 beds became, like all other dreams, dust. For the soldiers, the dream holiday was over before it began. Now was time for military expeditions, not walks on beaches, but walking in enemy territory, because Hitler ordered it so. The workers who had worked day and night to complete the hotel never saw it opened. The dream hotel became a nightmare under the care of the war, lost in dark days. The only option left for its architect Clemens Klotz was to leave his work to the mercies of time. It is now used as a museum, a memorial, an exhibition space and part hotel. One part has been left untouched, ruins and all. The dreams and hopes of the workers have crumbled like the walls they built. What's left is the tragic tale of Binz's coast. From the South Pole to the North, from the East to the West, traces of humankind are everywhere. So even on the Norwegian archipelago of Svalbard, can we find a place we have built then left abandoned? The Pyramid Coal Mine the Black Diamond Mine, set up in a far corner of the earth. It was built in 1910 by the Norwegians after rock was discovered hidden under ice. Only 17 years later, it was sold to the superpower of the time, the Soviet Union. The Soviets put their founder, Vladimir Lenin's statue in the center of the facility and put his words in their minds. Hundreds of Ukrainian miners migrated here to start a new life. A huge city was built to accommodate each miner and his family to live comfortably. Every necessity to live in this cold city was available. Assignments were given based on talent. Jobs dealing with food were especially important. In this showy cafeteria, we could understand how pleasing it was for the workers and managers to be entertained here. Considering the climate of the island, being able to swim was a large privilege, especially for the miners' children, so isolated from the world. One could swim or sweat it out in a game of basketball, but in the evenings, there was one place everyone gathered, the movie theater 
Hundreds of Soviet film reels are scattered around. Most of the campus shares the same view. The mine, closed down in 1998, has lived alone for a long while. Both time and the vandals who managed to reach even here have destroyed many relics of the past. The coal wagons are now filled with despair. Each building ruined one by one. The huge facility, an ever-growing burden on the island. We have come all this way to show that absolutely everything we touch dies one day. We spent the night questioning the system. When everything in nature is so perfect, why did we insist on making such imperfect attempts? Was it hard to work together to achieve something lasting? Or was it only utopic to think so? We may have found traces of a utopia in the south of Italy. Once, happy couples lived in this place where aspirations turned to apparitions. After the 1920s, these farming communities were part of a development plan. The village of Monteruga was one of these. Surrounded by olive groves, it was a peaceful corner blessed with fertile soil. Almost 800 people were placed here and told, this is your new life. It had schools, churches, bakeries, and even a post office. The government took care of all their needs with only one demand in return, produce. And produce they did. The agricultural development plan was working. High value commodities of the time like dairy, olive oil, wine, and tobacco were exported to all corners of the country and the world. It all went smoothly until the Second World War blasted it all to shreds. The war uprooted their lives and the system. While the neoliberal mentality reigned, the farms were privatized one by one. The power flowed from the state's hands into the bank accounts of the private sector. The pressure of competition forced the people from their villages. Urban centers provided more attractive opportunities and a more modern life. The farmers left their homes. They left behind a ghost town and all the trees. This was the last stop of our tour of untimely abandoned places. It was quite the task reaching this destination that attracts explorers with its fame, but it was well worth it. During our explorations of abandoned places, there were times we did not know where to begin to tell the story. This was one of those times. We have come to the grandest region in France. Everything here vibrates with disappointment after having led such a flamboyant life. 
We've come to see what is hidden amongst the Garden of Fragile Trees, a very old chateau, the Chateau Lumiere. After a short search, we were ready to describe this work of art, which shone in spite of its dustiness. It was commissioned by the Burroughs family, wealthy tobacco producers, in 1903. The architecture of the giant structure was 1,000 square meters of neo-baroque perfection, with its four floors housing over 30 rooms. The chateau was woven with many questions waiting to be answered. How did the owners of this palace suddenly disappear? What events did these marble staircases witness? We discovered a tragedy was hidden within the walls of these silent rooms. The Burris family were prominent representatives of French nationalism. This passion was to be their downfall. It happened when, during World War II, the Nazis wanted to buy tobacco from the family. Refusing to sell to them, Maurice Burris was sentenced to prison. Even though the sentence was less than a year, it was long enough for the family to scatter. Their fortune was confiscated, and they were exiled. The Nazis used it as a military hospital. The engravings, so precious to the family, were destroyed by countless soldiers running around carelessly. Even though the war ended, neither the Burris family nor the Chateau was ever able to recover. Maurice Burris passed away in 1959. The Chateau exchanged hands a few times, attempting to regain its former glory. But when abandoned again by its last owners, the thieves and vandals took over. The safe haven of a happy family had been ravaged by the storms of history. It is at least now under the conservation of the state. Whether it will be restored is unknown, but it has wounds that can never be healed.